NASA has many satellites orbiting the Earth that look at clouds from above, but we need your help to make matching observations from below. By getting the perspective from both sides, we can have a more complete picture of what's happening with clouds in the atmosphere. Satellites see clouds differently than human observers, and NASA scientists could never be in all the places they would like to be to collect data from the ground, which is why we need your help making observations. So we've been traveling around the world using drones and this technique to map corals in 3D. And the, really the biggest challenge we have with all of this data is how to classify it. How do we get the basic number of how many corals there are, how they're doing as a function of changing ocean temperatures. And that's where NemoNet comes in. So we built a video game uh, that ties into our supercomputer and you can download it and, and play it on your iPhone or iPad device. And what you're doing in that game is looking at our data sets that we are getting from around the world with these drones and helping learn about corals at the same time as coloring them and feeding data into our supercomputer. On Planet Hunter's test, we use data obtained by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. So TESS is a space-based satellite that monitors the brightness of thousands of stars, and we need your help to find the planets within these data. In particular, we want to find the planets that the machine and computer algorithms tend to miss. So auroras affect our technologies on Earth and in the sky, um, in satellites, and they move really quickly, and it's important um, to get an understanding of what they're doing, and citizen scientists can really help with that. What kind of discoveries have citizen scientists made uh, with this project? So one big one is something called Steve, which is actually an aurora that can be seen further away from the poles than the usual aurora. It's very unusual. It kind of looks like an airplane uh, condensation trail, but with a photograph, you can pick up these amazing colors as well. By studying it further with satellite data and other data from the ground, we've discovered it's it's really like a flow-driven aurora. It's an east-to-west flow that is lighting up the sky and doing some amazing kind of new, unusual aurora, um, auroral activity that's still being um, studied now. We astronomers thought that disks stopped forming planets after about five million years, but then the citizen scientists at Disk Detective started finding objects that were able to form planets about nine or 10 times the age of that, so into the 40 and 50 million year old age range. And uh, you know, the astronomy community is still trying to figure out what that means. So it's pretty exciting. Because once you have all that data, it really doesn't mean anything unless you have humans come in and help annotate what it is we're looking at. To put it bluntly, they are changing the world. I mean, we have mapped as of 2020 around 6% of the ocean floor. In, uh, in, in 2006, I think we had like five teams participating. Now we've got over 3,000 teams from 80 countries around the world that participate. Uh, citizen scientists are able to look at these images and see deeper into the images than the automated uh, detection utilities. Those are important observations because they're finding things that are that are missed in the original in the original data. Hello, my name is McDonald Chirara and I've been part of the Globe Observer program which is part of NASA's um, Citizen Science Project. I've been involved in this project for the past six months. I decided to participate in this project so that I get the opportunity to do something cool and interesting in my free time. Really exciting thing to be involved with, to be able to report and share what I see. I'm not a scientist, I don't have a great camera, I don't, uh, I'm not a professional, but I can be involved in something that's really important. And right now- Hey everybody, greetings from the Arctic. Team Hearts in the Ice saying hi. We want everybody at the SITSICOM to be super citizen science heroes. It's so much fun. Join in.
All right, I'm going to ask the panel to come on audio and video. Uh, we're going to do a quick public sound check, and then we'll get the event started at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time, so in about six minutes or so. Um, so for our sound check, let's start with um, Jared. Jared, if you want to tell us, um, I like this icebreaker from last time, so I'll use it again. Tell us something you're excited about and um, about your citizen science project or citizen science in general. Yeah, I'm really excited that we are, well, I'm really excited to involve citizen science in the world of kelp. And I'm really excited that by doing that, we're gonna learn about the history of kelp on earth in ways that we never have been able to before. Oh my gosh, I'm excited about kelp. That's why I wanted to moderate this session. I am obsessed with all things ocean and sea. I actually live on the space coast. So yes, we are nice. gonna dive into some kelp. This is gonna nice. be great. Awesome. Awesome. Allison, do you wanna go next? Tell us something you're excited about. Hi, Carolyn. Hello, everybody. My name is Allison. Is my sound okay? You sound great. Hey, I'm super excited that uh, this project I'm going to talk to you guys about today is uh, takes place in the most remote place in the world and we can get people on the ground, citizen scientists helping collect data that we can partner with uh, satellites from space. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. And then last but not least, Alan, can you tell us something you're excited about for this sound check? Hi, uh, yeah, sure. I'm Alan Lee and uh, I come from NASA Ames. Uh, we do a lot of coral studies. So our, uh, our citizen science projects based upon corals. Um, the most thing, uh, exciting thing that uh, we're excited about is collecting all the data that, uh, you know, the people are generating and painting on in our coral game and feeding it into the super, our supercomputer. So actually it's a melding between machine learning, uh, automated classification, and uh, what everyone brings to the table in citizen science. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to get my screen shared. Um, and as I do that, I just wanted to give the panel a quick heads up that um, the Q&A is active. Um, so, you know, as you're during the session, if you're not presenting, feel free to chime in in the Q&A and answer people's questions. We also have some folks from the whole SITSICON team answering questions in the Q&A box as well. Um, I know we already have some attendees joining, but we're not going to formally get started for three more minutes. Um, so I just wanted to let the panel know that about the Q&A. And then this session, I know you all are sharing your own slides. So once we make it through the icebreakers, uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and let our first person go. Um, and let me see who we have on first. Um, and this is such a cool session. I think it really shows that we can study, you know, the world beyond us. We can also study um, the world, the oceans, um, kelp, all sorts of different things. Um, so these are a quick preview of some of the projects that we're going to be doing today. Uh, we have floating forest. We're going to learn about that, how we can um, uh, study that. And then we have Fjord Fido, um, like Allison said, the most remote region in the earth. But um, I hope Allison mentions there's a cool new component to this project that you can potentially do from your own community if you don't happen to live in Antarctica. Uh, so we'll hear about that. Uh, and then uh, we'll end with NemoNet. Um, and once uh, all three presenters go, We'll have um, some time for questions. Um, I encourage you all to put your questions in the Q&A box. We'll try to use some of those during the question period. Um, and we'll also take some questions from Facebook and YouTube as well. Uh, I know we have about two minutes left um, before we formally get started. I wanted to ask the panel, do you all have any more tech-related questions or presentation-related questions before we start? Cool. <laughs> Great, 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 great. Um, all right, I'm just getting everything set up on my end. I really love these pictures. So cool. And if, um, for folks tuning in, feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, if you've already done one of these projects before, let us know that too. Um, that's always great to know. Um, I know for some of the sessions, we've had folks um, tune in who have made major contributions to these projects, which is really cool. All right, um, and we're gonna start in one minute. So I'm gonna hold off for one more minute just to respect our stated um, start time. I'm looking at the chat. I wanna see where people are tuning in from. It looks like we got some folks tuning in from New Jersey. That's cool. I'm uh, tuning in from the Space Coast of Florida. I actually have my uh, shirt I got at Goodwill, Kennedy Space Center is in the area. So <laughs> makes the, the Goodwill finds pretty righteous around here. Uh, we got somebody tuning in from St. Paul. We got New Mexico, Jacksonville, Florida, K 
Kansas City, USA. Somebody tuning in from Z Zagreb in Croatia. Oh my gosh, we got a global audience here. Brazil, Bombay, India, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the US. Yeah, oh, this is a good session for you all. Someone said namaste from Nepal. Welcome, welcome, we're so glad you're here. Hey there from India, and it looks like we're right at start time, so I think we'll get into it. So a few reminders. Um, this event is being recorded. Um, you can see us, but we can't see you if you're joining in through the Zoom. So we encourage you to um, either be in the chat or throw your questions in that Q&A box for our panel to try to answer. Um, if you're joining us through, um, on YouTube or Facebook, we do have folks monitoring those streams. Um, it's on SciStarter's YouTube channel and SciStarter's Facebook page. So feel free to ask questions over there, communicate over there, and we'll make sure that your voices are heard. And most importantly, we want everybody to have fun. Um, all of these projects, uh, and one reason I really wanted to be part of this session, all of these projects are really, really fun. Uh, my name is Caroline Nickerson. I'm on the SciStarter team. Um, you might have seen me in Citizen Science Month this past April. Um, I spend my days doing projects across all sorts of different disciplines, and the projects you're going to hear about today are really special. So I am excited to get into it. So let's do some polls to figure out who's in the room with us. So we want to know, are you a citizen scientist or an aspiring citizen scientist? Are you a student? Are you a parent of a citizen scientist? Are you a library or museum staff member or an informal educator? Are you a formal educator? Or do you identify with none of these categories? Are you just a bored person on the internet? Uh, whatever you identify with, feel free to select all that apply or let us know in the chat. And we're gonna go ahead and end that poll, share those results. So it looks like the majority of you are citizen scientists, welcome. Uh, we got quite a few students here, got a few parents. We got some library and museum staff, some informal educators in the house. Um, we have some formal educators and we also have people who identify with others. So anybody and everybody can be a citizen scientist. So we're so glad that you all are here. All right, we have one more poll question for you. Um, our next poll question is, have you participated in citizen science? Um, yes, for more than a year. Yes, for less than a year. No, you haven't, or perhaps you're not sure. Um, if you're not sure, that is a-okay. We are gonna give you everything you need in this session to get started. Um, all three of these projects are featured on scistarter.org forward slash NASA. So you can find in step-by-step -step instructions for each project on that page. You'll also be able to find the recording from this session in case you wanna go back and watch it later. And you'll be able to find um, the recordings for all the other sessions um, that are part of SIT SciCon which is uh, brought to you by SciStarter and the Citizen Science Association um, in partnership with NASA. Uh, so sci if you remember nothing else from this session, SciStarter.org forward slash NASA is where you can find the recording of this, the step-by-step -step project instructions, and all the other SIT SciCon info. All right, we're gonna go ahead and end this poll. We'll share those results. So it looks like many of you have participated in citizen science, um, but a lot of you haven't. 40% of you have not participated in citizen science before. So we, we have our work cut out for us, everybody, the whole panel. We are going to um, give people really clear um, guidance about how they can take action and make an impact with citizen science, and, you know, turn their curiosity into impact. And some folks aren't sure, which is totally okay, too. Um, you are all welcome here, and we're so glad you're with us. All right. So those were our polls. Um, these are our three speakers. So you heard it from them a little bit in the sound check. Um, we have... Um, Jarrett from Flowing Forest, we have Allison from Fjord Fido, and we have Alan from NemoNet. Um, these are all NASA citizen science projects that you can do. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves and their projects, and we'll start with Floating Forest. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here and pass the mic to Jarrett. Okay, um, can you hear me and see my slides? Yep, loud and clear. Rock on. Okay, that's great. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jared Burns. I am um, the uh, one of the project scientists on Floating Forest. I'm an associate professor at UMass Boston in the Department of Biology. I saw somebody's here from Duxbury. So rock on. I'm great to get some Massachusetts representation in there. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about our citizen science project, show you a little bit about how it works. And um, yeah, let's get into some kelp. I just love it. Um, so this is how I usually go out and sample kelp. 
right? So this is giant kelp, the kind of kelp you see off the coast of California or Tasmania, uh, New Zealand, Baja, so many other places around the world. Usually it's just us divers going out there counting kelp. You can see this looks almost a little bit like a Christmas tree with all of the uh, tags we've put on it for an experiment. And, and that's great, that's awesome. Um, you know, we have scientists around the world who are diving and collecting really good information about this big, beautiful, bold, brown seaweed that we see that dominates um, so much of the coastline in, in colder waters around the world. Um, but there's a, a problem, right? For any of you out there who are divers, you know that your air only lasts so long. If you're like me, your air doesn't last really very long at all. Um, and so if you want to learn about how kelp is growing and changing and pulling in carbon and um, how it has responded to climate change, we need better tools than just divers like me. We can only tell us so much. Because here is the global distribution of giant kelp. So again, this is that big kelp that you're used to seeing uh, maybe in the Monterey Bay Aquarium, places like that, right? So that the iconic giant kelp, you can see it's all around the world. And obviously, you know, just me and my tank, I can't cover all that area. And um, I certainly have only been diving since I was a kid. So, um, you know, since the 90s, and I want to go further back in time than that. The cool thing about giant kelp in particular is that it forms these huge canopies on the surface, right? So if you look at this picture, this is taken off the coast of California, and you can see this like lush, gorgeous kelp trailing across the surface. And that's awesome because we can actually see that from satellites. We can see it from some of the, the satellites that have been up there looking uh, down on the earth for, for quite some time. Um, so do you see it? Well, there's some arrows here pointing it out. So this is the coast of uh, Santa Barbara, California, where um, I worked a, a while back. And you can see, you know, I've dialed it in a little bit so that you can see uh, where the kelp beds are, but it's great. It shows up from images from Landsat. Other satellites too, but Landsat is the oldest record. We can go back to 1982 and actually look at how these forests have, have grown and changed. There's a problem. This is a beautiful image. Crisp, clean, clear, lovely. Um, as you're gonna see actually in just a minute, most of things don't look like that. And even with a beautiful uh, clear area like Santa Barbara, it took undergraduates uh, who are working on this project 600 hours just to process through this area alone. So this isn't something that you're gonna use to scale up to a planet. And so what we've done at Floating Forest is we're really interested in trying to work with citizen scientists um, to scale up, right? To, to try and look across the planet, take the data we get, even if it's, it's not uh, uh, the whole McGill as it were, um, start feeding that into some machine learning algorithms and um, actually build a really good global time series of kelp from all the way back in the 80s. So I wanna show you what this looks like. Um, and there are a couple of different ways that you can interact with floating forests. Um, the first, Actually, let's see, oh, I am going to try and share, uh, let's see if this will work. The first is actually from your phone and that's not gonna share. All right, new app, um, you know, that's always fun. So the, um, the main way you can interact with it is through our website. So here at floatingforest.org, um, we have a platform where you can do a couple of different things. Uh, you can either help us find where kelp might be. So take a look at an image and tell if it's an image with kelp or not, or you can actually circle some kelp. So I'm gonna show you some examples of that. So if you look at our images from our find kelp, yes or no, we ask citizen scientists like you to take a look at an image like this and you know, see if there's kelp here. And you can see, this is actually a great example picture because you can see there's something down here, right? So here's our coastline. This is all land. This is all in Baja in Mexico. Um, and you're like, oh, maybe that's kelp, but it's not green. It's not forming in a nice bed. These are the kinds of images that will actually trick computer vision. And so you would say no and carry you on to other images. And you can see we've really thrown just a, a wide variety of images at users to take a look. These are all images that have artifacts in them that might cause something using computer vision to uh, think that there's kelp in it. 
Um, you know, here, for example, we've got a nice river running through an image um, and it has some properties that are really similar to kelp. And so again, we need human eyeballs on this to help us train better computer vision and also just to build a time series. So that's one thing you can do at Floating Forest. And the best part is you can actually do this one on your phone. Uh, we run through Zooniverse, they have a phone app and you can sit uh, in line and swipe right for kelp as much as you'd like um, right on your phone app. The other thing you can do is we have this classify interface where here you can see we've got a nice little band of kelp. And I'm circling these little kelp forests that are here. Again, this is just off the coast of Baja. Um, and there you go. Now you notice my circling wasn't great. One concern that I always get from citizen scientists is, well, what if I'm not great at this? First off, we do have some tools. You can zoom in if you want to be really precise. But better than that, you know that 16 other people are also going to be looking at this image. So you can build some real confidence. And there you go. Now we have a classification in the system. So again, a lot of citizen scientists ask me, you know, hey, I'm really worried that uh, my imagery may not necessarily have been really good. My classification may not have been good. Now that's okay, because what we do with your classifications at the end of the day, so here's a, a photo, and here's how variable everybody was at circling kelp in this photo, right? We create these consensus classifications from what everybody does, and we really sift down to good agreement between lots of people. And that's so far uh, shown to be as accurate as expert scientists classifying this. So it's, it's really great by having a lot of you take a look at this, the wisdom of the crowd always wins. In fact, I'll tell you that um, we've actually found some beds that our original expert classifiers missed. I don't know, maybe it was a late night the night before, um, but citizen scientists have come in and shown us a couple of beds in old validation data that we missed the first time around, which has been great. Um, and this is work that's all run by my grad student, Isaac Rosenthal. Hopefully he's hanging around here today uh, and will be at this, uh, an amazing educator in his own right. Um, citizen scientists have been key. When we started running this project, our image processing was still, uh, remember, we're using Landsat, not Oceansat. Um, and so citizen scientists were key in helping us figure out uh, what image artifacts we were getting, what looked good, what didn't look good. Um, and we rewrote our image processing pipeline because of volunteers. Uh, we even had one of our citizen scientists rewrite our entire coastline detection algorithm for us. Um, and so that's been a really uh, huge success. The collaborations we've had with our citizen scientists have been really meaningful. Um, we're running full ahead on deep learning techniques now, but we also have a few other citizen scientists who've been interested and we're happy to hand over the data and let them start to play around with it as well. So it's a really fun back and forth. So if you're interested, one, download that Zooniverse smartphone app. Right now we have the very last bit of our Baja imagery up there. And starting Monday, I was hoping we're gonna get it today, but the image processing God said no. Um, we're gonna have some photos from New Zealand up there, which is, I don't know, it's like going to Lord of the Rings from space. It's beautiful, it's green, it's gorgeous, and there's kelp. Um, so check out the smartphone app. It's an easy thing to do, uh, you know, wait in line for coffee and swipe through some kelp. Uh, go to flowingforest.org and help us label some kelp and talk to us. And lastly, I noticed a number of you on this are educators. We have built curricula for uh, both for high school classrooms as well as for uh, college and university classrooms. So please give us a, a notice. We have a lot of curricula to share as well as some curated imagery sets for your classrooms. Um, it's been really great to collaborate with educators on this process um, and, and just a wonderful experience. So. Um, thanks, enjoy, and um, yeah, I'll just throw out really quickly, a, just a huge thank you again to collaborators um, and uh, to our community of scientists. Uh, it's, it's really been an awesome, awesome process. So thanks. Awesome, thank you. And I have lots of questions for you when we get to the Q&A, but first um, I'm gonna pass the mic to Allison to talk about her project Fjord Fido and introduce herself. So Allison, take it away. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to start sharing the screen. Um, 
Are you able to see that? Not yet. Oh, let's try. Oops. How about that? No, uh, not quite yet. No, oh, interesting. Okay. Um, all right, because I, sorry, you think I've done this enough. I need to share my actual screen through Zoom, not just through the, uh... I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I do it too. It happens to the best of us. Not through the Google. All, <laughs> all right. right. So let's get started with this. Apologies. Okay, you can see that all right. Uh, we see your uh, desktops. You might want to go to full presenter mode. All right, click that little present button. There we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Allison Cusick. I'm excited to be here, and I'm going to be presenting about one of the newer projects that um, is featured with NASA. This is Fjord Phyto. So it's looking at phytoplankton or the microalgae that exist in the ocean and how those communities are changing in fjords, which are just deep U-shaped valleys that align a marine coast. And this project is really looking at engaging travelers who go to the most remote region in the world, Antarctica, to understand phytoplankton dynamics using field samples, but also satellite observations. And I'm working with Dr. Maria Vernay and Rick Ren Dr. Rick Reynolds at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California. So to bring us to our location, I just wanted to make sure we're all oriented. Antarctica, um, and specifically, um, I'm looking at the Western Antarctic Peninsula, this portion that sticks out like a thumb close to South America. And Antarctica is very isolated by the Southern Ocean that swirls around the entire continent. And so if you have a perspective from the water, you can see here, once this video starts playing, that the entire area is covered in ice and glaciers. And these glaciers come straight down to the marine environment and hit the ocean's water. So we call those tidewater glaciers. Now, over the past couple of decades, scientists have found that 87% of these glaciers are retreating. So that is putting a lot of fresh water or meltwater into the marine environment. Oops. And so on the ground, what we end up seeing is a lot of chunks of ice, broken off glaciers, um, and you know, on top of that ocean. But from satellite, I've presented two images here. On the left, there's an example of, an, of one of the islands on the, near the peninsula that is, you can see is covered in ice, but then also you can see that the ocean color has also changed. So this is a mark of that freshwater, that meltwater that's coming from the land. On the right, I've also put an image just to compare in Greenland where you have faster flowing meltwater that comes from melting glaciers. And you can really see that ocean color changing, which is what satellites are able to see. I'm going to play one, one minute of this video to share with you what it looks like from the citizen science perspective and what the environment really looks like. Oops. The Antarctic holds magic in its waters and a team of scientists are determined to uncover the mysteries that lie within. But to understand what makes this ecosystem come alive, scientists need your help. Fjord Phyto is a citizen science project that engages passengers by collecting phytoplankton from the ocean. Phytoplankton are microscopic algae that form the foundation of most marine webs. And by looking at how phytoplankton communities change over the seasons, researchers are studying how it might relate to melting glaciers in Antarctica. Because to better protect an ecosystem, we need to better understand it. And by protecting the microscopic heroes of the Antarctic, we can protect the life that depends on them. Because conservation is not an eye. It's a me. So that is just a little foray into what type of samples are being collected. So we have partnered with the tour operators that uh, work down in Antarctica for five months every season. 
And that's kind of like way more than any scientist is able to be down there unless they're living in a station on land. And there are also many ships that are traveling up and down north and south of this coastline. So what we have done is partnered with certain tour operators from the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators and the Polar Citizen Science Collective to train guides that work aboard these ships in how to take samples. And then when travelers come down every day of those five months, they're able to engage them in collecting samples. As you see here in the middle panel, um, they can drop an instrument overboard that measures the salinity, the temperature, of the water all the way down to 100 meters depth. And that's important because when this glacial meltwater um, comes into the marine environment, that fresh water sits on the surface like a lens. So we can see where this meltwater might be. We can also determine the level of light using a simple instrument such as a secchi disc, which is like a dinner plate thrown overboard. We can also tow a net behind the boat. The citizen scientists will then collect that biological information, which is where we can see what types of phytoplankton, almost down to species level through genetics or micro microscope use, and see how those species of phytoplankton are changing over the whole season of those five months that every time a, a tour operator visits a certain location, we're getting that time series data. And then of course, another sample we can take now with the in, in the field, um, abilities to part pair with ground truthing uh, satellite information is this sample of meltwater where we can use an oxygen isotope signature to tell us if it's from the marine environment or the melted glaciers that came from land. And that will help us ground truth what satellites are also seeing. So in, in the image on the left, you can see the signature of meltwater from satellite data. Also the ability to look at the phytoplankton using their pigments, that green chlorophyll that you see. And then we are with the citizen science um, program able to be on the ground actually collecting those data points at a finer scale over space and time. And that's really important for the entire marine food web because these phytoplankton are really key to feeding one uh, krill, Antarctic krill, that is really connecting the whales that come down to feed, the penguin colonies that live down there, the seabird, other seabirds, the fish. It's really the entire ecosystem connected through how these phytoplankton are changing due to melting glacial water that comes into this environment. And our, of course, our participants are incredibly enthusiastic. They're curious, they've come down to this amazing place to see it firsthand and now get to help contribute to polar research, which is a very data limited region in the world because these are some of the harshest environments that Earth experiences. And it's been amazing to watch um, their faces light up. And they also have said that, um, you know, it enriches their travel experience. Um, some have told me that they felt that childlike spark of curiosity um, they just felt like that it was really amazing to know that they contributed to something incredibly important while they were on their, their vacation down here. And um, they go home and tell their friends and family about it. And over the past couple of seasons, so the season is actually opposite of the Northern Hemisphere, their summer is um, November through March. Um, we've had over 3000 participants actually hands-on collect samples from the water. Uh, and that's amazing. So um, we're hope we're this upcoming season, uh, starting October, November, we're hoping to continue that inspiration and engagement. So how can you guys all be involved? Um, if you visit the SciStarter.org NASA page, you can find this project, Cured Fido. And one of the really cool uh, things Carolyn had mentioned that is a new feature, since we understand not everybody can go to Antarctica, there are ways you can still get involved with phytoplankton and appreciating the microscopic life that exists in your own backyard, even if it's a puddle or a pond or a river, or you have access to the ocean. Um, we have an iNaturalist project, so you could take photographs from your iPhone if you're able to use a microscope to look at the invisible world. Um, and post those photos to iNaturalist, which is an observation tool that records what you're seeing. Of course, you can also visit our website, fjordfido.org, to le learn even more. And we would love if you engage with us on social media at Fjordfido. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
and YouTube. <laughs> and we also would love to know if you have plans to book a trip to Antarctica, then we would love to talk about how to get involved in that way. So um, thank you for your attention and I'm excited for the question discussion section. Thank you, Carolyn, and to NASA and to all of our participants for making this uh, enhancing polar science and what we know about the world. Awesome, yeah, and in the Q&A, um, I'm definitely gonna ask you to tell us a little bit more about the iNaturalist investigation because what I know about it sounds really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much, Allison. And up next, I'm so excited, Alan's gonna talk to us about MemoNet. So we'll let Alan go ahead and share his screen and um, educate us about his project before we get into Q&A. It looks like someone in the chat said that they're gonna be going to Antarctica and they're looking forward to their second trip. So Allison, I think you have a new citizen scientist coming our way. All right, Alan, over to you. All right. Uh... Hold on, I'm trying to share my screen here. Um, and nice background, I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. Uh, oh no, I have a new laptop. It's asking me to... Uh, uh... Don't worry, that's why we have backups. I can share <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love it when backups come in handy. Um, while you do that, I just wanted to remind all the attendees, if you're watching on Zoom, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching the recording, um, you can find all of these projects on scistarter.org forward slash NASA. Um, and you can also find the recording from the session. Yay, Alan's got it. All right, oh, Alan. there we go. Right. Ooh, uh, almost panicked there for a second. <laughs> all right. Hi everyone, my name is Alan Lee. Uh, I come from NASA Ames uh, on the West Coast, uh, Southern California uh, and the Laboratory for Advanced Sensing at NASA Ames. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And today I wanna to talk to you about uh, NASA NemoNet, which is uh, focused on global coral reef uh, management and uh, classification. So uh, these are the names of the other uh, members of our team. Bay Chariot is actually the PI. I'm the research scientist on the team, and we have Jared Vandenberg, our game designer, who actually created the wonderful app that you are going to be seeing uh, very shortly. We have Juan Torres Perez, and he's our lead uh, coral reef scientist on the team. So without further ado, uh, uh, let me get into it. Uh, this is a picture of our trip to Guam, actually, one of our field missions. So we actually do some really cool field missions, you know, to these tropical sites. And not everybody, not everybody can say, you know, they get to swim amongst coral reefs, um, you know, for work. So it's actually a great pleasure to be doing all of this. Uh, we fly UAVs, as you saw in the previous video, over these coral sites to basically come up with 3D models of the corals using some a new technology that we call a fluid lensing that actually can see through the water surface. Um, you know that this water surface is, you know, um, it's wavy, there's a lot of distortions, there's refraction, you can't really see what's underneath it. And this technology really brings uh, whatever is underneath that, those shallow systems really into bear. So a little about corals themselves and the threat that they're under. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows about this, and there has been plenty of news articles recently about what is happening around in our world, and especially the coral reefs, but these coral reefs in these tropical places, they're under extreme pressures, um, not only because of climate change, but also of other things such as, you know, ocean acidification and uh, human activity as well. So here, just to show you the contrast between the left side, uh, which is healthy coral, and the right side, which is bleaching coral, or uh, coral that is under such uh, warming temperatures and pressures. So what happens is, during these warming temperatures, the corals, you can think of it like they're undergoing their own sort of uh, a fever, because they think something is wrong, because all of a sudden the water is getting too warm. So as a result, they expel the algae uh, within their systems that help them make their own food. So in essence, they're trying to burn out whatever they think is wrong with themselves when the ocean temperatures are getting too high. And they can do this for a little while, but over time, you can imagine you can't really survive a fever for 
more than two weeks. Uh, that's pretty extreme already. And this is happening, you know, at a much longer scale. And a lot of these places, like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and all these tropical regions, they're seeing uh, mortalities in these coral reefs by up to 50% or even more. And that is what we are really trying to mitigate here. Um, a lot of this is out of sight, out of mind, unfortunately, for a lot of people, because if you see a forest burning down, you know, everybody would be in a panic. But these ecosystems, which are prolific in life, and they have so much biodiversity, are actually collapsing, and nobody really can see them. And so it's very hard to do anything about it. And we, we as a team, we want to bring awareness to this uh, situation. And even by playing the game and looking at the corals, you can see what is kind of going on and maybe hopefully uh, get an appreciation of these wonderful ecosystems. What if you could uh, help so NASA just a video create here. a map of the ocean Sorry, floor auto started. with just the tip of your finger? The ocean, teeming with life. It defines our blue planet, drives our ecosystem, and regulates our climate. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse and important systems in the ocean. They're also becoming an important source of medicines for some of the world's deadliest diseases. But they are dying at unprecedented rates due to rising temperatures. But we don't know how much we're losing or how much our climate is changing. We can't until we determine how much healthy reef exists now. And the only way we can know that is with your help. NASA MemoNet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real-life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. Every contribution you make brings us closer to solving this problem. Join the NASA team to help us understand these amazing ecosystems. Take command of your research vessel and learn about all the different types of coral. We must keep the ocean alive. It supports our life as we know it. Together, we can create a global data set of coral reefs and build a better understanding of how to save these aquatic worlds, one piece of coral at a time. Good luck, and welcome to the NASA NemoNet team. All right, so this NemoNet app is actually already on Windows and Android, and as well on uh, Apple's uh, App Store. So this is just a video of what you'll see actually when you get into the game. This is what we consider our home base. Uh, we really gam gamify this whole scenario to make the whole interaction fun for the users. So you can see you have your field guide where, uh, where you, um, you'll review corals that you've classified. Our game designer built a rocket, as you can see. So there's some Easter eggs hidden around. Uh, yeah, and you can review other people's classifications or you can go classify corals yourself. And this is just a sample of what you'll see in the field guide. So everything that you've classified so far, it'll give you examples. It'll give you some background about uh, what you're classifying and what you're looking for. And what this is actually a very high resolution view of what you'll see uh, in real life. So I believe the resolution is down to a sub centimeter accuracy. So a few millimeters. Um, so that is actually a sounding resolution. Um, to bring to your home tablet or wherever you want to do this. And here's a video of actually how you interact with the app uh, once you get in. So this is the introductory page um, that you're, you're seeing this person uh, color over. Uh, so it's like just, just exactly like handheld or hand painting, basically. You just move your finger over the area and it paints it in 3D. We have other 2D levels from uh, satellites, uh, but that's after you ranked up, uh, you've done enough classifications, and then you're kind of uh, unleashed into this more, more difficult world of uh, classification. So initially we start you off slow, uh, give you simple tutorials, and you only need to classify coral or other and some very basic forms. Uh, after a while, after you level up, you'll, we'll introduce you to more different classifications seagrasses and other different types of coral and uh, 
you you you'll see on the right hand side that uh, you also unlock these three D models of fish, sharks, uh, turtles as you level up, and they all swim around you in the three D environment. Uh, we also have this in VR, but uh, I'll have to say on my end, it's it's a little disorienting to try to navigate this in VR. All right. Kellen, so, I understand that you've been working so this with, is on this project. So can you young citizen scientists uh, that like have been working with us. Like Sorry for the auto start. You learned science by playing the game. It's kind of it's kind of like a game because it's not schoolwork. You kind of get to do what you want to do. You can choose where you want to be and what and what you want to do. They're like 2D, 3D, and then there's stuff like that. That sounds very fun. What kind of things have you learned from playing the game? There's a lot of different types of coral, and there are some key regions that have coral. Um, they are, you can classify Guam, the Great Barrier Reef, American Samoa, Hawaii, or Puerto Rico coral. So that seems like where the most of the coral is probably. All right, uh, <laughs> I'll cut that short because the video goes on for quite a long time, but that's on YouTube as well if you want to get information on uh, who's been helping us, especially, and a general sense of what Mibonet is. So this is actually what happens to the classifications that you give us. Um, there, every player basically sends it into our supercomputer. Um, as mentioned previously before, that uh, you know, don't worry about your classifications. This is first and foremost also a an awareness tool. And basically, we just want you to have fun while you're uh, classifying things. And we'll, we'll take all the classifications uh, at the end of the day, and we'll actually combine them uh, and, and rate them ourselves in our own algorithms and weight them uh, accordingly. So just have fun. And it's actually amazing to see these corals in uh, high resolution 3D. Just an example of actually what is built from all the classifications that are given to us. This is a heat map of algae and coral and their uh, 3D counterparts, uh, as you see here. So you can see from 0% uh, users to 100% users. You can really see actually the um, how everybody, the, the mean actually tends towards what is actually happening uh, or what is actually uh, being observed. So it's actually a very good metric when you take the average and you have some standard deviations of what everybody is classifying. So you can see most people agree, you know, the center of a coral is coral. And you can actually start delineating out boundaries of where these corals are just based upon everybody's classifications. So you can see the boundaries, they tend to be more 50-50 just because your finger probably can't get all the, uh, all the edges around that correctly. And areas of high standard deviation, uh, we can figure out that maybe there's something confusing there and uh, we can have trained uh, scientists, coral reef scientists, take a second look at it. But this is actually a very good way to get an idea of what everybody thinks uh, when they're classifying. So you can visit us on this, uh, the SciStarter page here um, and you can download, uh, it has all the links that you need to uh, go and try the game. Uh, but you can also go onto the App Store and just type in uh, MemoNet, and it'll probably be the first uh, first result that shows up. And please don't forget to uh, check us out at uh, MemoNet.info or uh, the SciStarter page. And um, yeah, without further ado, uh, I think uh, that's it. So thanks for your time, and hopefully you go go download it and at least check out all these uh, 3D transects that we've made for you guys. Thanks. Ah, oh, this is awesome. All right. And we have lots of time for Q&A, which is good. So um, thank you so much for that. I'm going to steal the screen back from you so we can get just quickly review. So you heard from uh, the team at Floating Forest. Um, you also heard from the Fjord, uh, Fjord Fido um, with Allison. And then we just learned about NemoNet. So now it's time for questions. So for the audience, feel free to put some questions in the Q&A box. And if you're watching on YouTube or um, Facebook, feel free to uh, put your questions in the comments, but I have some questions of my own, so I'll start off. Um, first question is for Jarrett. So I know you mentioned that you're bringing in um, some images from other places, so New Zealand's up next. I was wondering what makes kelp in different parts of the world different? And if the, the citizen scientists who are participating, they'll be able to see those um, differences when they participate. Will they 
but your hardcore floating forest folks, will they be like, oh, wow, this New Zealand kelp looks X, Y, Z? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So um, that's a really good question. And there are differences, some that have really surprised me. Um, so, you know, we're mostly working at uh, looking at kelp that forms canopies on the surface. Um, mostly, or at least where we started out, was with the giant kelp, Mac Macrocystis periphera. I noticed uh, once something fly by in chat where someone was asking about, what about Nariocystis or these other, so someone who knows their stuff. Um, so there are, there are a lot of different, so actually behind me, um, this is a Clonia maxima, which uh, is in South Africa, different species, right? Um, so many of these different species, and we are eventually going to expand out into areas of the world with non macrocystis species, will look a little bit different. Um, so you might have, uh, you know, more ragged edges or, or things that are, are different. Um, one of the biggest surprises for me, we started this project in California where you've just got big, nice, solid chunks of kelp. Um, the first two uh, tests that we did, first we tested our new platform on uh, Tierra del Fuego down in, in Chile. And there, like, I was blown away with what the beds looked like. Instead of these kind of nice little coast hugging beds, it was just these like massive blobs of, you know, just these, these huge lush forests that the whole area would be, uh, would light up. Um, which, you know, Darwin described those forests on his uh, voyage around the world and 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 it it you know just brought all of those emotions back and seeing those if that's what these primeval forests still look like. Um, in other places like the Falkland Islands, which we just finished up, there are other kelps in the system. So um, actually that kelp is it's super cool. It's the species called Lasonia that looks like something out of Alice in Wonderland. It's this like gnarled branching uh, kelp that, you know, it, it maybe is, is, you know, can be six uh, to eight feet tall or, or taller even, uh, but really different, but it doesn't get up to the surface. And so there, if you look at a kelp bed from a satellite, um, there are all these like little empty patches here and that's where uh, the other kelps have sort of taken over. So it's this very different, like almost Swiss cheese like beds. So you'll see different patterns and different beds. And that's one thing that we'd love to dig into at some point is what are the differences in those geometry? Um, but yeah, it's, it's really noticeable and I'm, I'm very excited for New Zealand to see what that looks like. And people should expect that next week, right? If they um, tune in. I'm, I'm hoping so. Um, I literally, I was going to do something that I probably shouldn't have and run those images during this talk. Um, we just got the images in, but the processing is like still, I'm, I'm actually watching files scroll by in the background. Um, yeah, and actually to, to educators, um, the reason that we're running, so we we started with the Falkland Islands to build up an understanding of that. That was sort of the first part of this round of the project. Um, we have two things going on right now. So my graduate student, Isaac, who I showed that picture of, is running something he calls Kelp in the City, um, where he's looking at cities around the world that have kelp forests and trying to understand links between urbanization um, and kelp. And so he's running, I think he'll be running another round of that starting in two weeks. And that's really cool because you can see you know, these kelp beds right next to, say, the coastline of Los Angeles, right? And look at how Los Angeles has changed over time, as well as how these kelp beds have. Um, and then our kelp on the edge is trying to look at changes in range limits. Um, so can you actually see things moving as the climate has shifted? So uh, we're, we're finishing that up in Baja. Um, we're running it in New Zealand because a school teacher asked me if we had any New Zealand images. And I said, what a great idea. That's one of, it's on our list. I'll bump it up because it sounds like you're going to use it in class. And then we're going to be launching um, some South American areas, areas where no one really has any sense of uh, long-term change over time. So um, that's going to be, you know, brand fresh new data. Um, I'm very excited for those as well. Oh my gosh. So yes, everyone, this is very exciting. It's amazing that you take volunteer input like that. So all the more reason why people should join your, um, you know, floating forest community. Great. So my next question is for Allison. Allison, if you could tell us a little bit more about how folks can participate in Fjord Fido from home or from their communities if their community doesn't happen to be, you know, Antarctica. Excellent question, Caroline. So the, you know, the intent with the capturing the community of travelers that went to Antarctica was the 
what we realized is any given year, you have 5,000 scientists that work down there. And then there's a tour industry coming that just, you know, the le- most recent year we were able to travel was over 87,000 travelers. So for us, it was like, how do you capture that community? But then we were realizing that, okay, but how do we get more people engaged with phytoplankton elsewhere in the world? And that's where we had the idea of starting the iNaturalist project. So iNaturalist is an app-based smartphone pro- um, app tool that you can make uh, photographic observations. And then through that platform, a community of uh, people will kind of move that picture or image to a research grade vetted observation um, that is kind of contributing to global biodiversity. And this can be at the single cellular level. So if anybody has a microscope at hand, it doesn't have to be a fancy microscope. It can be a simple microscope. And even one that attaches to your iPhone itself, there's some uh, really cool options that you can get. And then you go out and you can use, actually, if you want to make your own phytoplankton net, Uh, to collect that phytoplankton, you can find a do-it-yourself phytoplankton uh, collection net. Actually, if you did do this, I would love to see pictures if you send them to us. You can cut um, like nylon stockings and attach it to a a bottle that you have. You can cut the bottle in half and kind of make your own net. So you can just walk around with this net at any part of water that you have access to um, in the environment and then practice taking pictures of, of trying to just get one, you know, phytoplankton, they're so tiny and single cell. And one thing that w- might make this tricky when I've talked to people at iNaturalist is if you have too many of them in one image. So really trying to focus on just one single cell um, is key for this ability to move that um, identification to research grade. And so in that way, people from all over can help populate that database and get to know phytoplankton better. There is a project harmful algal bloom watch that exists for Southern California, but really to expand this appreciation for the microscopic world is is the the goal. And then of course, um, even for travelers that are down in Antarctica, this will be mimicked. Uh, So if there's microscopes on board the ships, we're also designing a photographic identification guide so that people who aren't familiar with phytoplankton can still make those observations themselves and really learn about these crazy creatures that we really don't uh, appreciate in our our existence walking around on land all the time. So I hope that helps answer a bit about how to get involved with iNaturalist and find the Fjord Phyto uh, project within that. And then, um, yeah, happy to ask more questions if the instructions on that uh, webpage um, need further information. Awesome, thank you. I'm, I'm definitely, it's on my list to participate in. When you, um, you know, gave us those instructions, I was really, really psyched. So really cool stuff there. Um, my next question is for Alan. I know you answered this in the Q&A by writing out an answer, but it was such a good question that I thought we could um, re-up it for the whole audience. Um, so Annette wants to know, she said, the Nema Net video implied that we can save coral reefs one reef at a time. Um, Is there any suggestion towards solutions? And she said, just knowing how much corals are being impacted may not be the only part of the solution. So Alan, if you could speak to that, I thought you had a really great answer there. Yeah, actually that is a great question. You know, it is actually uh, very difficult to, to, for us, you know, as land dwelling species to uh, save all the corals one at a time. And certainly knowledge is uh, what, where, what and where these corals are impacted is, is at least the first point of data that we have gathered. Um, but as to your question about like, what is, what are we currently doing? Actually, we're partnering with uh, local ecological advisors. We have a new project coming up called Picogram um, with Hawaii that's actually taking NemoNet and really operationalizing it. Currently, NemoNet is a research project, right? And so it's actually proving out new technology. But we want to do, what we want to do is bring NemoNet and the classifications that you made and this uh, machine learning tools that we've created to help uh, local ecological advisors. So, I mean, we did a, um, we did uh, some, some of our efforts for American Samoa were investigating some corals that were actually somewhat resistant, resistant to um, warming waters. Uh, and when the scientists got there, they were surprised and were wondering, hey, why are these corals faring a lot better, let's say, than some of the corals in uh, the Great Barrier Reef? And there has been rewilding efforts, basically, to 
try to repopulate these uh, coral colonies. And so NemoNet hopefully in that sense will operationalize the fact that when these ecological uh, advisors go in and managers go into their backyards to do these rewilding efforts, well, we can say, hey, look, is the, is the coral growing? Is it shrinking? Uh, is it staying the same? What is working? What is not? Uh, what are you doing for the corals that are, are making them more successful or less successful? And I think that is really the next step for us uh, at NemoNet. That's awesome. And we actually have a related question um, from an attendee. Um, James wants to know, what can I do to save coral reefs besides learning about them? Okay. Um, <laughs> NASA, as a, we don't want to like direct policy and tell you, you know, exactly what you guys should or should not do, you know, or donate money or whatnot. So um, besides for that, all we want to recommend right now is just be aware uh, on your impacts of things like climate change, um, how we are affecting the world. And uh, for now, I would say, you know, try to learn about, as you were saying, learn about everything that is going on with the corals. Um, uh, aside from that, it's, it's building awareness, I think is, is the first key to the process. And then afterwards, afterwards, if you felt you had enough impact, then maybe we can, you know, look at some of the, uh, the local ecological decisions that are happening in your community, for example. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I will say to James, um, I think citizen science is really empowering for me because the first step really is, you know, a data-driven understanding of a problem. And NemoNet is a project that allows you to get at that. So it's really, really important. Like you can't understate the importance of understanding what's actually going on and the, the granularities of it, right? Like how it might be different in one part of a coral reef versus another. Um, let's see, a lot of questions about corals. Oh my gosh, we have lots of questions from lots of people. Um, yeah, I'm trying to answer them. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you get back to it, typing all those answers. Um, actually, I'll, let's do one more coral question. And then I have another question for Jared, another question for Allison. Um, someone wants to know about the different kinds of coral reefs we have in the world. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a hard one for me because uh, I'm not by nature a coral reef scientist. I'm a machine learning scientist. So I wish I had backup on this for, from my, our uh, coral reef specialist on our team. But I would say uh, hundreds at least, uh, if not thousands. So I'm sorry to give such a ballpark answer to this. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah. Oh. Well, and also in the in the game itself, right? I saw um, that there were some learning outcomes built into it. So as you play, you also learn about the different types of coral reefs there are out there, right? Yeah, it really depends on how specific you want to get. So I mean, on the families level, and then on the species level, you might get, you know, thousands. But if you want to generally look at the, you know, hard corals versus soft corals, okay, there's only two types. But then as you keep on going down, you know, the bio biodiversity chain, then it expands outwards to a lot more, you know, families and a lot more species. So you might, if the families, you might have, you know, probably uh, two dozen or three dozen that I think I saw in the, uh, uh, NemoNet app, but then yeah, uh, you can keep on going down. And then, the, you know, the more specific you go down, the more gray it gets because not even all coral reef scientists agree on the exact classifications once you get into the species level. So then it gets a little more hairy, but what we really want is probably more, more on what everybody can agree on, uh, on, the, on the higher side. That's awesome. And yeah, thank you so much for, yeah, I know it's so tough because you're, you're a machine learning scientist and people probably ask you all the time, like, what about this type of coral? Uh, but thank you for, for being game for this, for the work you do. Um, another question for Jared. So um, I, you got at this in your presentation that people can be a little nervous about getting started or worried about, you know, doing something wrong. Uh, do you have any um, further advice for those folks or like any tips and tricks about how to make the classifications on floating forests? Yeah, I get that a lot. Um, and I also get the flip side, which is, you know, uh, uh, you know, very stuffy scientists saying like, oh, citizen science, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I'll show you grant reviews sometime. <laughs> um, no, that's, you know, what we do and what Zooniverse has been so amazing at is really thinking about consensus classification. 
this idea of the wisdom of the crowds, that many people looking at something, you know, any one person is not necessarily going to get it perfectly. And, you know, heck, when I do these things myself, well, you actually, you saw a little bit of my classification. I'm not perfect either. Um, but the idea is if you have, you know, many people taking a look at some of these images that um, you're going to be able to build up some degree of consensus. Now, there is the question of, and, and actually Baja has been a really, really interesting case study. Um, <clears throat> there are other things that look a lot like kelp um, in some of these images. So sometimes plankton blooms can look a lot like kelp, although they're fleeting. Um, but mud flats in particular are these like nice big green blobs. And it's very tempting to be like, oh, that's a big solid kelp bed. Once you, you learn that, you know, kelp beds typically look like a nice solid green blob, um, then, then it's very easy to recognize them. Um, but people have, Baja has had far more mud flats than anywhere else that we've looked at on earth. And so that's really, um, what's been great is again, feedback from our citizen scientists who immediately went to the image forum saying, hey, these look like the weirdest kelp beds I've ever seen. And we said, you know, you're right. We had like one or two images in the tutorial to tell you to watch out, but clearly this is something that is gonna become an issue. And so we've put a lot more signposting up um, to help people feel better about their classifications and to know what are the, the sort of tricks to watch out for. Um, so we provide a tutorial, we provide a whole library of images of things that are a little bit tricky, um, but really it's that back and forth and that feedback um, in our talk forum. So I find that so valuable. Um, it's such a great place to help uh, teach people about what they're seeing. Um, and also, you know, some fun emergent hashtags come out of that. Like we, uh, in looking at the Falklands, people notice some areas sometimes of the year because we have a lot of metadata associated with it. So you can see when was this image taken? What's a link to a Google map that I can actually look at it, maybe zoom in a little bit more. People started noticing it looked like certain times of the year there was more kelp than other uh, times. And so the hashtag uh, so kelpy was born. And so you can kind of go through hashtag so kelpy on our uh, uh, subjects and start to really pull out some really good example images. So that that kind of uh, um, sort of emergent discussion from our citizen scientists has been incredibly useful. That is awesome. And I think we have time for one more question before we have to go. Um, and I'll direct it at Allison. Um, so Allison, I always love asking this question. And I asked it during Citizen Science Month um, when we did our event together. I'm gonna ask it again, because I think you had an amazing answer. But um, What's something about your work with Fjord Fido so far that has surprised you? I forgot what answer I gave last time, but I think um, I think what's surprising is actually just how much people really get into this, even while they're participating at first, uh, hearing about it. You know, when they get on the ship and then we start presenting what is available to do during the journey. People are like, nah, I don't know, that doesn't sound fun. Like some people are like, I don't know about science. And as soon as they do the project, they're like, that was way more fun than I thought it might be. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so I think just the unexpected enthusiasm people have once they really can dig in and, and see a hands-on contribution uh, is really what makes all of these projects uh, more personable to people that they, you know, this is science we do together. It's not, it's not just one person that can answer these questions. So um, yeah, I think just the real enthusiasm about the community aspect of doing research together is I, not surprising in a bad way, like surprising, like heartening, so. I think that's the perfect note to end on. So with that, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, and I, thank you so much to everybody today for sharing with us, to our whole panel. Um, we really, really appreciate you and, and the work you do every day. Um, up next for SITSICON, uh, we have our SITSI SIPs um, followed by a SciStarter happy slash social hour. Um, so that's going to be moderated by Derek Fitz. And there's some awesome projects in that one too, like JunoCam, uh, the Sungrazer project, um, and more. So definitely uh, come to that. You can find the RSVP on SciStarter.org forward slash NASA. That's also going to be on Zoom. Um, and that's starting as soon as I end this Zoom. Uh, and also, we hope you join us again tomorrow. We have a full day of sessions tomorrow, including um, citizen science near you, 
uh, citizen science to save the world. Uh, we have a, a session on diving deeper. So what comes next after you participate in a NASA citizen science project? Um, so, uh, and, and so much more as well. So we hope you come to all of those sessions. Um, and once again, just thank you so much to our whole panel and thank you to all of the attendees and citizen scientists who are here with us. Happy Friday, everybody. See you in the next session.